The movie opens in Ireland, where we learn the McManus family have been living as shepherds for the last eight years or so. And apparently they haven't bothered to get a haircut in the last eight years. And already we have a problem. And no, I don't mean the wigs and the fake beards, although they do look pretty cheap. I mean, after the end of the first movie, how did we end up here? The Boondock Saints ended with the brothers reuniting with their father and formally revealing their existence to the world by publicly gunning down crime boss Papa Joe Yacoveta in a courtroom. This was meant to be a warning to all lowlifes to get their shit together or meet the same fate as Yacoveta. But according to the sequel, the McManus clan left for Ireland immediately afterwards and have been there ever since. Kinda cheapens the ending of the movie, doesn't it? How far are we gonna take this, uh... Eh, we're not actually gonna take it anywhere. Wait, what? Yeah, I'm thinking it's better if we just feck off back to Ireland and tend some sheep. Then what was the bloody point of that public execution? I dunno, seemed like a good idea at the time. Well, anyway, one day the family is visited by a priest who informs them one of his fellow men of the cloth in Boston was gunned down by an unknown assailant, and the killer made it look like the work of the saints. You may have noticed a moth flew into the shot during this scene, and this is the take they went with. Duffy does actually have an explanation for this, though it's not a very good one. I remember one of the camera guys says, we're gonna have to redo that, there was a moth that flew up, and I was like, I love the fucking moth. The moth stays, he's in the movie. Because then people will be like, did they release that moth? <laughs> What's the significance of the moth? No, I think most people were like, why didn't he just shoo the moth away and do another take? Naturally, the brothers cannot stand for some punk besmirching their good name, so they gather up their weapons and hitch a ride on a cargo ship bound for Boston. And for some reason, they decided to cut their hair and shave their beards. Which seems like a terrible idea if you're trying to sneak back into a country where you're a wanted fugitive. Wouldn't you want to disguise your appearance? Hell, even the brothers don't seem to understand why they did it. The fuck we cut our hair for? Yeah, that's right. It don't seem like the thing to do at the time, though, didn't it? And I'll bet you thought I was just being silly when I made that seem like a good idea at the time joke earlier. But no, that is apparently how the Saints operate. Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. Murphy does at least have the good sense to suggest dyeing their hair, but when he suggests blonde for the color, Connor starts laughing his ass off. Like gay, 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 I'm fucking warning you. Because only gay people have blonde hair? I... What, what's the joke here? I don't get it. While they're on the boat, they meet their new comedy sidekick, Romeo, played by Clifton Collins Jr. And how do they greet their new sidekick? By pointing a gun in his face and threatening to kill him. You know, like you do. Oh, but it's okay, because it was all a joke. They were just fucking with him. Those zany McManus brothers, oh, what fun they have. That shit was not funny! I agree, it was stupid. This is a pretty obvious callback to a similar scene from the first movie where the Saints, after killing off a group of Russian gangsters, decide to fuck with their friend Rocco who has just arrived to attempt to kill the same gangsters. The difference is, in the first movie, this was actually funny, because you knew these guys were good friends and this is what good friends do. They fuck with each other. Granted, most friends do so without firearms, but the basic principle is the same. But doing this to a guy you just met is stupid and it comes across as a poor imitation of the first movie. For that matter, Romeo is a pretty poor substitute for Rocco. Nothing against Clifton Collins Jr., his performance is fine given what he has to work with, but the character just has some god-awful dialogue. I thought you said your car was inconspicuous. Yeah, well I don't like words which spit right in the middle. Get it? Because he's Mexican, so he doesn't like any words that sound like sp Oh, I can't say sp one of these days, I have got to fix that thing. Meanwhile, in Boston, the police are investigating the murder of the priest, and naturally, that involves the three stooges from the last movie, Detectives Greenlee, Dolly, and Duffy. Because of course the director named a character after himself. Naturally, they're in a panic because they helped the Saints kill Joe Yacoveta in the last movie, and they're worried the brothers' imminent return might get them in trouble. They are joined by our Willem Dafoe substitute for this movie, Special Agent Eunice Bloom, played by Julie Benz. You have got to be Greenlee. Smacker always said you were the funny one. Well, funny as in ha-ha, though, not like funny as in gay, because I'm totally not. Did she give the slightest indication that by funny she meant gay? The fuck is going on here? 
And like Romeo was a poor substitute for Rocco, Eunice Bloom is a poor substitute for Paul Smecker. And again, I don't really blame the actress, Julie Benz just doesn't have much to work with. Duffy had her play the role with a southern accent for some reason, and it sounds so incredibly fake and just makes the character annoying. Her dialogue doesn't help much either. I don't see why the fuck the Fed is even whoa, involved. Whoa, 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 whoa. Fuck. But this isn't a fuck situation, is it? I mean, I can understand a goddamn or two, but- Okay, first of all, have you seen the first movie? They weren't exactly conservative with their use of the F-bomb. I even made a video highlighting this. And second, Inside that church is the corpse of a priest with two bullet holes in the back of his head and exit wounds on his face. In what universe do you live in where this is not a fuck situation? And third, fuck you. Anyway, Eunice examines the body and determines the shooter was far too short to be one of the saints. She comes to this conclusion because when the saints executed someone, they'd shoot him in the back of the head and the bullets would exit through the eyes. But when our nameless assassin killed the priest, the bullets exited below the eyes. And that doesn't sound right. If the bullets entered the skull at about the same location, but came out below the eyes, that would suggest that compared to the work of the saints, the gun was pointed at a lower angle. But if the entry point was the same, then wouldn't that lower angle suggest the shooter was taller than the Saints? Not shorter? Something does not add up here. Well, geometry questions aside, the shooter was apparently hired by the son of Joe Yacovetta, Consacio, played by Judd Nelson. The goal was to draw the Saints back to Boston so he could finally exact his revenge for his father's killing. These... Sons of bitches, prison fucked us! In the ass! We don't talk about it. Rape victims seldom do. Really? Comparing them to rape victims. Stay classy, Duffy. But of course, the Saints can't jump straight to the boss level. First, they have to go on a few minor killing sprees and take out some of Yakavetta's underlings. And this is where Duffy's weakness as a director really shines through. The only trick he knows for creating an action sequence is slow motion. And boy, does he love that one trick. Now, there's nothing wrong with slow motion as long as it's used sparingly, but when you overuse it, you ruin it. And it's true that he used quite a bit of slow-mo in the first movie. Hell, it was made in the late 90s. That was kind of a thing back then. But he didn't overuse it nearly as much as he did in Boondock Saints 2. This time, every shootout is nothing but slow-mo. And after a while, it gets boring. Actually, that's not quite true. There is one shootout in the movie, one, that plays out in real time. But then immediately after the shooting ends, the scene actually starts over and plays out again, this time in slow-mo. What the fuck was the point of that? I don't need a slow motion replay of what happened 15 fucking seconds ago. This isn't a football game. Eventually, Special Agent Bloom introduces herself to the Saints and informs them that, like her predecessor, Agent Smecker, she's here to help the Saints hunt down and kill the bad guys and ensure they don't end up in prison. This means she's actually on the same side as the Three Stooges, but she never mentioned this before because... Well, girls got half a fun. That's stupid! You're stupid! Stop being stupid! So now that Bloom, the detectives, and the Saints are all on the same page, it's time to take out Yakavetta. And here we come to another piss-poor imitation of the first movie. There was a scene in Boondock Saints 1 where Agent Smecker examined the site of the Saints' most recent killing spree, and using his brilliant detective mind, pieced together exactly what happened. And the audience watches it unfold in the form of a flashback. As the scene progresses, Smecker gets more and more into it, almost to the point of insanity. It's silly and over the top, but it's a hell of a lot of fun. This time around, it's Agent Bloom hosting the flashback as Annie fucking Oakley. I just... I have no idea what the hell Duffy was thinking here. This looks fucking ridiculous. And yes, Defoe looks kind of ridiculous in the first movie, but for me, this is taking it too far. 
and it gets even weirder when the bullets finally stop flying and Romeo spouts his new catchphrase. Who ordered the whoop-ass fajitas? It goes over like a fart in church. But then... Broke down the door, didn't you? Ding dong, motherfucker! Ding dong! Fucking A. You said it. What the fuck just happened there? Did he travel back in time to do his catchphrase over? And was Bloom doing some kind of astral fucking projection in order to talk to him? What is this? I don't even! Well, anyway, after that shootout, you'd think the movie would be over. But it turns out Yakaveta was not the final boss after all. He was merely a pawn in this game, and the assassin was actually hired by some other guy simply known as the Roman. It's at this time that Greenlee suddenly gets killed off. Wait, what? Yeah, just like that. Dead. And I'm not really sure why. I'm guessing Duffy was trying to do something similar to Rocco's death in the first movie, but it really doesn't work here. Rocco was a close friend of the Saints and was with them from the beginning, and his death felt like a genuine tragedy. Greenlee, on the other hand, was never really more than a comedy side character, and his death comes right the fuck out of nowhere and doesn't have nearly the same impact. Anyway, the Saints find themselves in a standoff with Greenlee's killer, who happens to be the assassin who killed the priest. But their father, Noah McManus, suddenly makes his grand entrance and... challenges him to a game of... Russian roulette? I... Why... Why... I... Fuck it, this movie has gone off the deep end. I give up. After that nonsense, we finally learn something about Noah's past. Back in the day, he watched helplessly as a trio of gangsters murdered his father. Driven by a desire for revenge, he tracked down the gangsters with the help of his friend Louis and killed them. Unfortunately, that was only the beginning. Killing mobsters became an addiction. Louis helped him for a time, until one day he suddenly sold him out to the police. It turns out Louis was actually working with the Mafia the whole time and used Noah to eliminate the competition. And once he had done so, his services were no longer required. If you haven't guessed by now, Louis is the man known as the Roman. And he used Yakaveta to lure Noah and his sons back to the States for one final confrontation. This raises one very important question. Why couldn't this have been the focus of the movie? This is a much more interesting story than the one involving the McManus brothers, and with more interesting characters to boot. But before we can get to that final confrontation, we have to sit through a dream sequence with the brothers' former comedy sidekick, Rocco. And a cat. The scene starts out okay, with Rocco assuring the brothers that they're not to blame for his or Greenlee's deaths. They both knew they were putting their lives on the line and they accepted that, and they were proud to stand side by side with the Saints. And if it had been left at that, all would be well. But then Rocco begins to lay out his manifesto, with the emphasis on man. And yes, that's actually how Duffy describes it. Already that's setting off a red flag because it sounds like something a men's rights activist would say, but it starts off innocently enough with a shout out to the blue collar workers of America. And I can get behind that. Hard men! Yeah! Doing hard shit! Fuck yeah! And that gives me a hard on! But not in a gateway or anything. And like that, you've lost me. What is up with this movie? Why is every character so concerned with everyone else thinking they might be gay? For a movie that seems to stress the importance of being macho, it sure comes across as incredibly insecure. Interesting contradiction there. But considering who made this movie, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. Basically, if you don't like Boondock Saints, you're a douchebag. Anyway, the scene continues with more macho bullshit about smoking and drinking and eating red meat and not seeing a therapist, because therapists aren't manly, I guess? I don't know. Real men hide their feelings. Why? Because it's none of your fucking business! You know, I get the feeling I've seen something like this before. Do you guys remember the sitcom Home Improvement? Of course you do. Rocco's manifesto sounds a lot like something Tim Allen's character would say on that show. Something that would ultimately get him into trouble and would lead to him learning a valuable lesson. But in Boondock Saints 2, that macho bullshit is the lesson. 
and I find that a bit troubling. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to tell you how to live your life. If you want to die like John Wayne with half an undigested cow in your ass, go right ahead. As long as you're not hurting anyone else, do as you will. But I do have to ask one thing. What the fuck does this have to do with the plot? What do smoking and drinking and all that other shit have to do with vigilante justice? What does hiding your feelings like a real man have to do with Noah getting revenge on Louie? What does any of this have to do with anything? Why is Rocco giving this speech on the importance of being manly? Because the brothers took five minutes to mourn Greenlee's death? Oh, how dare they? Men do not cry! They cried when you died, you ungrateful asshat. Moving on, we're finally at the face-to-face -face confrontation with the Roman, played by Peter fucking Fonda of all people. Finally, after all these years, Louis reveals why he sold Noah out and also informs his former friend that he has been helping to rebuild the Yakaveta clan since the death of Papa Joe. And his plan was to let the Saints take out the rest of the family's leadership so he could take over. Now that they've done so, their time to die has come. I wish the rest of the movie was as good as this scene. Connolly and Fonda absolutely killed it here. And this one simple conversation was more entertaining than a thousand of Duffy's slow motion shootouts. Speaking of which, we got one more of those and thank God it's the last one. It ends with both Noah and Louie taking a bullet and the wounded Connor, Murphy, and Romeo are promptly arrested by the police. Well, if they want to kill bad guys, I suspect they will have no shortage of targets in prison. And our story ends with Eunice about to flee the country since she's been found out by the feds. But as she's about to leave, who should she bump into but... Agent Smecker? Willem, we missed ya! Yep, it turns out Smecker faked his death and has been working behind the scenes ever since. And now he's working on getting the boys out of jail and back to work. But we'll have to wait for the third movie for that, and I... can't really say I'm looking forward to it. Like I said, I still see the first movie as a guilty pleasure, but the sequel was just a letdown from start to finish. The plot is weak, the action sequences are boring, the dialogue is terrible, and overall it just feels like a cheap imitation of the first movie. If you're a Boondock Saints fan, just skip ahead to the stuff with the Roman and ignore the rest. You won't miss anything of value. And if you're not a fan, this definitely won't change your mind. Before I sign off, I should mention that this review has largely been based on the theatrical cut of the film. But there is a director's cut available, and unlike the unrated version of Boondock Saints, which simply includes all the tiny little bits of violence that Duffy had to take out to secure an R rating, the director's cut of Boondock Saints 2 adds about 20 minutes to the film's running time. I'm not sure why. The only major addition in the director's cut is this weird subplot where Connor keeps spotting a black cat that appears to be following them. It's actually the same cat that shows up at the beginning of the dream sequence with Rocco. I'm not sure if this is supposed to imply the cat is the reincarnated spirit of Rocco watching over the boys or something, but at least the cat's presence in the dream makes a bit more sense now. Beyond that, the director's cut doesn't add anything noteworthy. It simply extends scenes that didn't need extending in the first place. In the end, whether it's the theatrical cut or the director's cut, it's a lame action movie with a sprinkling of macho bullshit that is nowhere near as cool as it thinks it is. How appropriate that the title's abbreviation is BS. Come to think of it, that's also the abbreviation of the title for the next movie I'm gonna review. But until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. This is the song written for the train chase. This is the chase, Rocky and Ken. He tried to kill me with a forklift. Olay!